Okay. So thank you and welcome to the project presentation. Today is November 8, 2022, and is uh, one day after we concluded our hack for an F. So thank you everybody for your submissions. I think you enjoyed the extra three days we gave you. We thought that would be a, a good bonus to complete your project. So I will run a couple of slides and then um, I will pass it to Annette for some um, welcoming and some uh, communications. But um, today, first of all, the meeting is being recorded and you can watch it later if you want. And there are closed captions available through the Zoom CC button. So if you need to activate them, uh, go ahead and do that. So the agenda for today, I will pass it in a minute, as I said, to Annette, president of CTF for a few words, but then the main um, point is the project presentation. Lucas from Be My App will be in charge of queuing and uh, you know timing all of the presentations. We have um, some of the judges, if not all uh, already, so they will ask, questions at the end, one or two questions, and then we'll give you also some time, timelines at the end of all presentations to when the winner presentation will be. Um, just a few stats for you to understand the magnitude of this event. We had 303 registrations for the event, 135 participants that uh, came to the Slack workspace and overall, uh, we qualified eight full project submissions. So thank you so much. And these were very good projects, very high level projects. And in total, um, we had 52 active participants in projects that were highly engaged in the, in the, in the hackathon. Uh, a few slides are due to thanks um, all the mentors and judges. Mentors, of course, they completed their activities, but I just want to um, mention that this has been really a team effort. We couldn't make it without their support, but also the judges that will start their <laughs> activities today and they will look at every project and, and, and make recommendations for uh, the winners. And on top of that, organizers, but both from the Children's Tumor Foundation team and the Be My App team. So thank you all. And not uh, last but not least, our sponsors and data partners that helped us to um, run the event. So Alexion, AstraZeneca Rare Disease, Recursion, Springworks Therapeutics, and TAP. And then our collaborator at the American Heart Association for the Precision Medicine Platform, uh, our collaborator, collaborators at the American uh, Association for Cancer Research for Project Genie Data, our collaborator at Sage by Network, the Open Cravat uh, team, but also um, all of the initiatives of the Open Science Initiative and the data portal that has been developed. So. Thank you all guys. And I will now pass to and introduce Annette Packer, our president for a few words. I will stop sharing and put you on screen, Annette. Thank you. Thank you, Salvo. Um, first of all, I think most of what I was supposed to say, Salvo just said, so <laughs> I just wanted to welcome you all at this amazing Hack for an F event. Um, as you saw from Salvo's slide, we have over 300 participants that are donating their time and expertise to this event. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I also want to echo the generous sponsors that Salvo was just mentioning, like Alexion, AstraZeneca, um, Springworks, NTAP as our partners and all the other sponsors that were on the slide that Salvo just um, showed. I think what is, uh, as you know, Children's Tumor Foundation is really committed to accelerating neurofibromatosis to be able to end NF, as we say always in our vision setting. But the organization is next year 45 years old, and we have spent over $500 million now on NF research. And one of the things that uh, we really hope with the hack for NF and with everything we're doing uh, for the moment is how can we grow the field? How can we expand the field and get more new expertise into 
this um, NF space. And for your time and your expertise, I, I really want to thank you. Also, the other partners that have been sharing their data, whether it's the data portal that we're funding at Sage Bio Networks, um, the ACR Genie project, and the NF Open Science and Open Cravat. Um, I think this is all an opportunity to grow our field and look outside the window and grow even a, a larger family than we have um, today. I'm really excited to see um, 10 projects, um, a lot of um, new insights, a lot of new ideas. Um, so I would say I'm handing it back over to Salvo and thank you, thank you, thank you to the teams we're working with and a special little thanks for our internal team for driving this and pushing this forward with the energy that is needed in order to make this a success. So let's start. Let's see who wins this, Salvo. Thank you, Annette. So, okay. So I will, uh, let me complete my um, presentation into the next slide. Um, and this is where we are. So in the next hour, we'll have eight projects that will present and those eight are uh, our finalists um so we'll start with um in this order that you see now on screen so lucas will queue and play the videos and i will ask members of those teams to be ready at the end of the, uh, the video playback to answer a few questions uh, from the judges if there are any and then we'll move to the next video and and project after so it will be on a rolling basis. So we'll, um, we'll put it on the chat. We'll monitor the chat. Um, anyone can ask questions. And I will also ask the project team, if there is a specific questions to your team, please respond it or you know, trying to reply on the chat as well. So without further ado, I will stop sharing and ask Luca to share and start with the first project. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, Salvo. And just to echo everything that's been said, thanks everyone for joining. Um, so I'll start pretty quick here uh, and work my way down the list as I go to share my screen. Um, but I will also do my best to put in the chat uh, which team is up next, just so you're ready to answer questions uh, after the uh, presentation goes up. Um, so without further ado, I'll our first uh, team that we're playing is NF1 Drug Targeting Team MCH Makers. So I'll pull up your video now. We'll watch this for three and a half minutes. Uh, and then judges, you can ask any questions. And if the audio or anything goes down or something goes wrong, of course, let me know since I'm playing these live. Uh, but I'll go full screen here and we can begin. We are team MCH presenting NF1 drug targeting for benign and malignant tumors. Our team consists of Matthew Zamora, Ashta Naik, Chang Inmoon, also James, Paul Zamora, and Richard Conroy. NF1 has a lack of treatment options and cancers are part of that problem. Neurofibromatosis type 1 has no commonly accepted drugs for adults. NF1 has diverse lists of cancers, and these cancers can occur throughout their lifetime. So it can mature into a, a malignant cancer from a benign cancer, for example. So we've provided a list of possible drugs and gene knockout targets for NF1. And in particular, we also explored the malignant cancers and what some of those targetings might be. So we took a two-step approach. First, we did broad NF1 therapeutic targets, looking at primarily benign NF1 cell lines. Uh, and then we took a deeper dive at malignant cells. So looking at the benign cell lines, there were six benign cell lines uh, in the high throughput screening data that we had. And we were able to also look at a normal reference cell line, which was in human foreskin fibroblasts. And we were able to determine a relative potency of a drug relative to that normal. So was it more potent or less potent than, than a conventional uh, cell line? 
And based on that, we were able to create a ranking score and a rank sensitivity based on how many of the six cell lines were responsive and in what direction. Following that, we looked at chromosome 8Q gain. We noticed a trend from prior literature where certain flavors of cancers uh, are known to have this gain. It is known that a variety of cancers are more lethal on average in NF1 patients, and also they tend to form earlier. Among these are malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, ovarian cancer, and also melanomas. It was shown previously that uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors have chromosome 8Q gain most often, and it was derived in this research that also melanomas and ovarian cancer show that same trait. So looking at that, we were able to devise two data set cohorts for chromosome 8Q gain and chromosome 8Q no gain. Based on that, we were able to use area under the curve scores from drug screening data. Uh, we had over 100 cell lines and 1,448 drugs. We then did a Wilcoxon rank sum test between the chromosome 8Q gain cohort and the chromosome 8Q no gain cohort. We performed non-parametric statistics for comparing medians for the non-normal outcomes. And based on that, we were able to set up a list of drug names associated uh, as potential targets for the malignant tumors that are common and more severe for the NF1 genetic disease. Thank you very much. Awesome, cool, and already done with that team. So I'll get the next one queued up here, but first, if there's any questions for team MCA. Got a YouTube video playing automatically, I'm sorry. Um, but again, if there's any questions for team MCH, uh, if the judges would like to ask any, and then artificial intelligence for NF, you will be next. Um, but yeah, any questions for the team? Yeah, first of all, is there any team member uh, on the call? Any yes, guys? there are okay. two team members okay. available. Great. So is there any question from, and first of all, Matthew, thank you for uh, coming out. Just want to make sure you your 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 project is on challenge one. So it was using the Gini NF tumor identification and classification. My challenge was challenge three. Oh, oh right. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I I actually am reading the slides that is on screen. It's my mistake. Is any of the judges um, has any question on the project? And, and I apologize. I'm, my name is Taylor. I'm one of the judges. Um, will we have the ability to ask questions um, later on as well as we review everything? Or, or is this our, our last shot? This is almost the last shot. Almost the last shot. Okay, got <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't have a question now, um, I mean, you can still type it in if you if it will come up during this, this call. Um, and we, we can always allow you to reach to the team through Slack if, we, if you guys have any question. So that, that's still possible. Um, but yeah, if there is any burning, you know, urgent things that comes out and you really want to understand a little bit better, otherwise, I, I, yeah. I guess there will be other, other, but indirect, let's say through emails or, you know, Slack channels. Sure. Slack channels. That makes sense. Our team, I, I is very, our team is very attentive to the Slack, so we're happy to and, you know, just hit us up. Perfect. I appreciate that, Matthew. Matthew, can, I'm not a judge. I just have a question. <laughs> the the malignant data you guys looked at is that was that mainly sarcoma data or was that malignant in in general? So we looked at um, melanoma, um, ovarian cancer, and um, malignant uh, nerve sheath uh, uh, tumor. Uh, is that right, uh, James? So yes, we looked for the ovarian cancer and the melanoma and the MPNST, which are the malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. And these tumors we look for, um, 
we look um, based on the previous literatures, just looking on understanding the genomic landscape and also there's an NCI block that also suggests cancer that appear to be more deadly in people with NF1 are either the pleuromorphic sarcoma, hydroglioma, and PNSTs, ovarian cancer, and melanoma. So there's um, a list of cancer they wrote it down. So we focus on looking on individual um, copy number data, if possible. And one of the biomarkers they have in common was a amplification or a gain on the chromosome AQ region. So therefore, that was a biomarker we could settle for and then maybe perform some statistical tests by using the drug screening data that is available on the map. And there's also a lot of um, the secondary uh, gene, gene knockout data that are available for the DEM map to see whether they have decreased fitness after you um, apply any of these gene knockouts. Hey guys, this Negative. is Carlos. I'm also one of the judges. I have uh, just a comment and a couple of questions. First off, this is great work, really, really impressive. Uh, my qu first question is, uh, did you address benign tumors um, as well? I'm looking at the project, uh, the written report, and I see mostly, if not only, cancerous tumors. So the benign tumors were largely the first phase of the work where we were using the uh, the the, act, uh, the activity curve, the sigmoid curves for uh, drug effect. Uh, the idea there is that that, that uh, gave us a, a cell line that can be used in the benign space, whereas the, the later work was specific to the malignant space. Uh, the, the work we did in the malignant kind of showed, you know, uh, 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 it, it did reinforce the work that we had done in the benign tumor space, but we kind of went through the, the, the problem with the benign was there just wasn't quite as much data. It was hard to get very specific. There was a lot more data for the malignants. So we use that to kind of reinforce the work we done with the we did with the benign data yeah. set. But but that is there in the uh the first one where we had the sigmoid curves and, and that is part of the initial list. So uh in in our in our long form paper we have a a step by step approach we propose clinicians are able to take uh, to kind of personalize uh the drug selection. Um, and and in, included in that is is the that you know we're aware of benigns and benign are part of uh, what we're proposing there, but but it is it is very situational uh, uh, the drugs and and kind of the effects and all that stuff. But I'm wondering if you really need to look at benigns or if they will skew your results um, in a different way that you don't want them to. Um, so maybe folk, I, I don't know, but it's worth looking into maybe just focusing on malignant. And lastly, I, I read the. Uh, your document. Can you briefly tell me a little bit about the future directions that you're considering? Uh, yes. So uh, we would like to be able to uh, expand, uh, especially if the malignant work. Uh, we we covered mal uh, ovarian and uh, MPNST. Uh, we would like to look at other uh, types of cancers as well. Um, we're, you know, informally, you know, we're, we're looking to, you know, build up to a paper, build up to a more formal uh, presentation. Uh, we have a large collective of really knowledgeable people. We have a good complexion of machine learning specialists. Uh, I have some uh, industry connections that we'd be able to work with. Uh, so we're really looking to, uh, you know, reevaluate what we've done, make sure, you know, we didn't have time for all of the uh, assessments on, uh, uh, is a drug, uh, and especially a small chemical, is, is a small molecule a good target for manufacturability? There's a lot of manufacturability com, uh, considerations with these drugs as well uh, that, that we would, if we had more time, we'd go deeper on the R-squared values, for example. Uh, so we, we, we just like to uh, extend our work for more data uh, and you know uh, solidify some of our uh, assumptions and, and add some value. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, judges, for your questions. Um, Team MCH, just so you know, I saw Chang, you answered one question in the chat. There's also another from another judge, Ben, that you can answer there. Um, but I'll move on to the next team here. We have artificial intelligence for neurofibromatosis or Team AI for NF. I'll play your video now. 
Hi everyone, we are the team AI4NF and we are presenting our solution for the challenge one. Our approach is to use machine learning models to find the most relevant gene mutation for each cancer type and then apply natural language processing techniques to cluster related genes. Our approach is divided in five steps. Download the data, create the data set, train the supervised machine learning model, then apply model explainability techniques like SAP to understand future importance, and finally, use NLP for the most important genes. I will show you the web application that we developed to interact with the models and uh, with the information generated with the NLP analysis. We can select the future that, is, uh, that we want to explore in which uh, model is important. For example, in this case, in F1, we see that is important for melanoma, glioma, and all these uh, cancer types. And then we can focus in which cancer type we want to see all the features that are important. For example, in this case, for glioma, we see that CRAS is the most important one, and then we see the list of all the features. We can see also this information with a bar plot, and also with SHAP, uh, we can see how is the relation of the future with the model prediction. For example, in this case, the red represent high values of the features and the blue points represent low values. In the case of uh, e the, e the H1 SNP mutation, we see that high values of the future represents a high probability of uh, this cancer type. We also can explore uh, the model metrics to see how was the performance during the training and the test and validation. And finally, the NLP analysis that is done with per topic. We can cluster the, the genes that are more relevant and see how these clusters are related. We can also see uh, this in the hierarchical clustering to see how the different clusters uh, are related. And finally, we can explore the topic uh, work scores for each of the topics to see what are the most important words uh, in each cluster. Finally, we also have the repository with all the documentation in detail to see how the models work and how is the process. Finally, we have some future directions in which we, we would like to work and the team that have been done this work. Thank you very much. Awesome. Cool. Thank you to the team. Uh, if anyone from the AI for NF team is here, uh, feel free to come off mute and judges, you can ask any questions. And then up next, we'll have drug discovery in NF1. Uh, but yeah, if anyone from the team is here and if judges would like to ask any questions, go ahead. Yes, we are here. Awesome. Cool. I guess I will go first. So I had uh, uh, some questions regarding the features you use. So can you please elaborate what type of features were they? Uh, and in similarly in your NLP model, uh, what did you build the NLP model on? Like what was your input? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, for the first part, uh, we use the, the mutation uh, file that from the Gini data set and we convert it to uh, uh, to get uh, for each mutation which uh, variant type is presented. So uh, we generate uh, one hot encoding with these features, and for each patient we have a vector uh, where we have a uh, one when the mutation with this variant is present, and a zero when the when there is no mutation for this variant. And in the second part, uh, for the NLP, we use uh, the Marvel API to download the GenInfo data. And then uh, we use this text after applying a cleaning techniques to for the NLP analysis. Thank you. That answers my questions. Mm, thank you. Uh, I can go next. I'm Tarun, one of the judges. Um, so I see you used uh, the boosted uh, uh, one for machine learning. Is it same as the XG boost, the models? Uh, it's like GBM, uh, the one okay. from Microsoft. Okay. Of... And what's the reason you chose that? Um... If, because it has a very good performance and is very easy to train. 
uh, in fact one of the next steps that we would like to do is uh, to train a, an embedding with artificial neural networks instead of uh, this model but yeah, for simplicity okay uh, in fact I, I see that one of the teams in the challenge one <laughs> is also mm -hmm. doing this idea so <laughs> yeah that's what and i was that i was sense. thinking the neural networks may be a next step for this yeah and and um, you know when you look at uh, the next steps uh, and combining the results from nlp and what you've done um how do you see all of this analysis coming together and driving the uh, results uh, because we, we want to uh, help to analyze all the gym because there are a lot of them. So for the researcher that want to uh, understand which genes are important, we will we do this we did this clustering so uh, we can explore the different um, family genes how, how to speak with a similar function. So it will be easier to analyze all this information instead of go one gene by gene finding info about it okay thank you thank you awesome cool thank you so much team and uh lucas just so you know there's a couple other questions there in the chat for your team um but without further ado i'll move on to the next team we have drug discovery in nf1 i'll play your video now Hello everyone, my name is Kathy Sun. I am a junior at Brookfield East High School in Wisconsin. Today, I'm going to present our project, reversing the detrimental gene expression in PNF by integrated drug screen mining through prediction and validation of drug screening data. We are team NF Buster and we are taking on challenge number three. Our data and code has been deposited to GitHub. We want to compete for best use of data, best project page and challenge winner. This team consists of my dad and I. My dad is a researcher at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Our considerations in the drug screening challenge. Firstly, there's a potential drug response bias from screening data because the screen data are mostly from PNF cell lines with human TERT or mouse CDK4 genes. The arbitrary genetic change may cause bias in drug screening. Transcriptome drift between physiological condition and cell culture is also a confounding factor. Publicly available data and links is very useful to explore the drug screening targets. This database includes more than 54,000 small, small compounds in tumor drug screening, 431 data sets, and 353 cell lines. It has identified 4,082 gene overexpressions with many signatures established. We will utilize the reversal of gene expression signatures method, SRGES, to prioritize drug candidates in their linked database based on their scores. We will use the PNF cell line drug screen as experimental validations for the predicted drug candidates. Now that we have our fishing rod, the R program, and our bait, the SRGES scores, we can go fishing from the pond of drug screening data. We hypothesize that decreasing the highly expressed genes in tumors will inhibit the PNF growth. It's similar to the game whack-a-mole, but we will instead use inhibitors to reverse upregulated DEGs, the moles. Firstly, we will use publicly available microarray data for PNF and generate the differentially expressed genes between PNF cells and normal human Schwann cells. We will then feed these results into the R package OCTAD, the Open Cancer Therapeutic Discovery, we can isolate the predicted drug targets based on their SRGES score. On the parallel, we will utilize the HACNF 2022 dataset and select the seven PNF related cell lines. And then using pCampbell, another R package, we prioritize the related drugs for PNF. The hack for nf database contains more biologically relevant drug information. So it's important to overlap our lists to further validate the most effective drugs. Thus, we overlap the two lists one based on the SRGES scores and one with more biologically relevant NF data. This allows us to identify the most effective drugs. Here are our team's top drug candidates for NF1. We have validated 22 distinct drugs and 169 targets. 
Here are our top five winners. As you can see, most of them are kinases. Our future directions include validating our top five drug candidates in PNF1 cell lines. We also hope to further validate one to two more effective drugs in vivo. These are our references. And here are the data sets we used. We would like to also thank the NF Hackathon community for their support and promotion of the awareness for PNF in our new generations. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy, to you and your team. I'm not sure if you're on the Zoom, but if you are, feel free to come off mute and say hello. Uh, and judges, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead. And then our next team will be Next Gen LP. Um, but yeah, any questions? And Kathy, are you on with us as well? We might not have Kathy on the Zoom, um, but judges, if you do have any questions, um, please do put them in the chat and then I'll make sure that I copy them over and send them over to Kathy after the webinar. Um, and then we'll all help you uh, connect some answers from there and everything. Um, but great job, Kathy, to uh, you and your team. So next up, we have Next Gen LP. I'll pull up your presentation right now. Hi, I'm Gabriel Altai, and I'll be presenting Team Next Gen LP's approach to Challenge One. I was joined in this work by Hari, William, and Karthika. Our method consists of creating subsets of genie data, forming sentences from mutations in tumor samples, and embedding those sentences in a high dimensional space using techniques from natural language processing. We use two definitions of NF related in our work. One indicating if a tumor sample had a mutation in NF1, NF2, SMARC-B1, or LZTR1, and the other indicating if the tumor sample had a cancer type of nerve sheath tumor. We then used our embeddings to predict cancer type from tumor genetic profiles and explore NF-related structure with the TensorFlow projector, a general tool for visualizing embeddings. Tumor samples from Gini come from multiple centers. Each center has multiple gene panels that detect mutations in a different set of genes. A Gini subset represents a selection of gene panels, the set intersection of genes they cover, and the tumor samples with mutations detected in that shared set of genes. If this step is not performed, our embeddings will tell us more about the cancer centers and their gene panels than they will about the properties of the tumor samples themselves. We created eight genie subsets, which explored different trade-offs between the number of samples included and the number of genes shared by a set of panels. We also identified how many NF1 and NF2 mutations were in each subset and how many nerve sheath tumors were in each subset. For each genie subset, we created gene mutation sentences. We tried several ways of creating sentences, but the example I'm showing creates sets of genes that are weighted by pathogenicity scores like polyphen. Next, we use these gene sentences to create several kinds of tumor sample embeddings. In this slide, we show an embedding based on how often pairs of genes are mutated in the same tumor sample. Each row of the matrix on the lower left represents a gene embedding. We then combine these gene embeddings to form tumor sample embeddings. We came up with many choices in terms of how to make genie subsets, how to make mutated gene sentences, and how to create embeddings from those sentences. To compute embeddings for all combinations of these choices, we used the AHA Precision Medicine Platform. With these computational resources, we created 146 sets of embeddings, each representing a different triplet of choices from the gray boxes shown on the slide. With embeddings in hand, we applied simple classification algorithms to these tumor sample embeddings to see if they could be used to predict cancer type. Many of these embeddings were effective for some cancer types like gastrointestinal stromal tumors or colorectal cancer but none performed very well on nerve sheath tumors. Next, 
we use the TensorFlow projector to visualize and explore our embeddings. This tool allows interactive 3D visualization and allows the user to display metadata about the tumor samples. In the image pictured, we started with a full genie subset, removed tumors without NF1 mutations, colored the samples by the cancer type, and then selected a single sample with a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. The tool then showed us the 100 nearest tumor samples and their cancer types in the right-hand panel. While this does not directly predict or classify NF subtypes, we found it to be an interesting way to generate hypotheses. Thank you very much, and I'll leave the conclusions here. Awesome. Cool. Thank you to the team Next Gen LP. Uh, I'm not sure if your team's here. I think I saw Gabriel at one point, uh, but if anyone from the team is here, feel free to come off mute, say hello, and then judges, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Hello, I'm here. Awesome. Cool. Any questions from our judges? We'll give it a couple minutes here. Lucas, can you uh, maybe leave the conclusion on screen? That will may trigger. Oh, yeah. Can I ask a question, Gabriel? I'm, I'm probably too stupid to understand how you did this, but what would what would be the implications of this for? Patients, treatments, understanding more. Um, that's a great question. I I'll try to give an answer, but my my background is more in machine learning and natural language processing. But the way I understand it, um, we're looking at the genetic profile of these tumor samples, and the embeddings we created represent co-occurrences of genes. So. What it might show researchers or clinicians are sets of tumor samples, sets of rare NF tumor samples that might be similar to other more common diseases that might uh, suggest treatments that could work in both cases. Or, um, which was kind of the goal of the project that we didn't quite get to, are, are there genetic profile subtypes of NF that are different perhaps than the classic subtypes of NF that are defined. So what you call a sentence are in fact co-occurrences of certain genetic abnormalities. Yes, the, the sentences are the variants and then the embeddings capture the co-occurrence of variants in, in different tumor samples. Uh, I have a question. So why did you... Uh select the NLP approach for co-occurrence, why not some sort of a graph embedding or graph neural network approach to generate these embeddings? Uh, that's a very good question. We actually, uh, I did think of that, um, but there was only a week left when I thought of that. But okay. the matrix of co-occurrences is very similar to a graph, right? Like the, you can think of it as a weighted graph actually. And where there's zeros there, there will be no edge. Where the numbers are high, there would be a heavily weighted edge. Um, but the the approaches are, are not so dissimilar. And you could do random walks on the graph to create sentences as well. It, it would be a very similar approach. It, the, the weighting of the different uh, components would be not exactly the same, but they're highly related. Uh, another thing uh, is like, can you do some sort of uh, um, can you can you come up with metrics to figure out or uh, determine whether uh, this clustering which you are getting or the similarity metrics which you are getting uh, can we benchmark this or uh, come up with a method to uh, figure out how good is this clustering? Yeah, tell me which ones are NF tumors, and I'll tell you how the clustering is. <laughs> but in in all seriousness, I think the Classification of the cancer type was part of our way to get in there and say, are these embeddings representing physical things that are useful for these? Um, and uh, I, yeah, clustering in general, unsupervised learning in general, it, uh, quantitative evaluation metrics of clusters are hard to come by, but there are other things you can do, like you know, how compact is the cluster, how well separated is it from the mm -hmm. other clusters, things like that. Sounds good.
Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much, Gabriel, to you and your team. Just so you know, there's another question from Annette in the chat. If you'd like to Just answer. If you win oh. the lottery, what are you doing? Yeah. Okay. Two, two things, actually. One, um, the further steps would be how to combine uh, different subsets of Genie data together in a more efficient way. Like we, the subsets ended up being fairly small. Um, so a million dollars, send every single NF patient, or probably more than a million dollars, send every single NF patient to, you know, one gene panel and get, the, that has the most genes and get everybody tested in a unified way. Um, second, we only showed the variance data from the data mutations extended file. Um, you can play the same sort of game with the copy number alterations data as well. So you can make sentences from that. And that's going to, the, the way those things cluster will show you a different aspect of the tumor samples and then you can continue to play the game of we can add the variant embeddings to the copy number alteration embeddings and get that data all into one pot and see what happens there and, and what would you be your strategy for for multi-omic integration that's something that i personally have struggled with a lot with with this data <laughs> but yeah um so when sorry when you say multi-omic integration does that mean combining different panels yes um yeah that's a really good question. I think that could almost be a whole hackathon by itself. I, I don't have any okay. amazing ideas. <laughs> right, right, right. No, that's not fair to ask you on the spot. But um, but yeah, a, a challenge. Be hackathon, Salvo. Breaking notes. Awesome. Cool. Thank you again so much, Gabriel, for your presentation. Uh, up next, we have predicting pathogenicity of NF1 mutations. Let me set this to one playback speed real quick, and then we'll get started. Hi, I'm Isaac Dimitrovsky. My teammate is Laura Spitz, and I'm going to talk about our project for Challenge 2 using deep learning to predict whether NF1 germline mutations will cause disease. We specifically looked at missense mutations or mutations that change just one amino acid in the NF1 protein. This is a complex problem. Changing an amino acid could disrupt interactions with other proteins, and predicting this is complex even when we know the interactions. We also speculate there may be some important interactions that we don't currently know about. So since this is a complex problem, we'd like to use powerful deep learning models that can learn complex rules. But if we try to do this in the usual way, then because there's very little known data to train on, we'd probably overfit. In other words, we do very well on the training data, but badly on new examples that the model hasn't seen. We instead propose a simple way to use deep learning. Our method is unlikely to overfit because it's so simple. We also speculate that it might be able to implicitly learn about some of those unknown interactions. We use pre-trained transformer models from Ross Lab. The language these models are pre-trained on is proteins, and the words are amino acids. Transformers are trained on a masking task where we give the model a sequence of words with one word masked off and ask the model to predict the missing word. So the model can use the whole sequence aside from the missing word for prediction. Now, transformers are very powerful models, and the ones we use are trained on very large data sets about 200 million and 2 billion proteins. So they have plenty of data to learn very complex rules about how proteins are put together. We propose to use as a mutation score, simply the ratio, the probability of the normal amino acid divided by the probability of the mutated one, where the probabilities are predicted using the whole NF1 sequence with just the mutated amino acid mass. So a high value means the mutated amino acid is predicted to be a lot less likely than the normal one. And we propose this indicates the mutation is likely to be pathogenic. We tested this on the LoveD data set and found it correctly predicted about half the pathogenic mutations while generating very few false positives on the benign ones. Interestingly, we did significantly better with a model pre-trained on the larger data set of 2 billion proteins. The source code is available on Synapse. More good stuff. Our method is very simple to apply. With some pre-computing, you could even do it on a spreadsheet. We also speculate that if this method is able to deduce unknown interactions, it could be complementary to methods that are based on specific knowledge of NF1 domains. 
As follow-up, we propose testing on more data, for example, from ClinVar. Since this is a general method, we'd also like to try it on other proteins, and we'd like to make it publicly accessible, for example, as an open cravat annotator or as a spreadsheet. Awesome. Cool. Thank you to Isaac and the team. Uh, Isaac, I know you're here if you'd like to come off mute and say hello. Uh, and then judges, if you have any questions for Isaac, feel free to ask. And up next, we'll have Team CG Health. Uh, but yeah, judges, any questions for Isaac and his team? Uh, I have one question. So if I understand correctly, this model was uh, the... the uh, language model is uh, sorry the the model is all the transfer model is already pre-trained uh you are just using that on this uh new data set which you have uh and when you said it can be implemented on in an excel sheet i don't understand how uh, i'm assuming it would be a big model so how it can be implemented in simple excel sheet well you can pre-compute the probabilities for all the amino acid positions using the model and then just put those values in the spreadsheet. So you, you're kind of pre-computing all the possibilities to begin with. And then when you have a particular mutation, you can just take the ratio for those two numbers so that that can calculate any missense mutation. Okay, all right, makes sense, thank you. Awesome. Any last questions for Isaac and his team? Uh, and just a reminder, if a question does come to anyone here in five or 10 minutes, whatever it is, you can put it in the chat as well. Um, but yeah, any, any last uh, live questions? All right, perfect. Okay, so up next we have Team CG Health. I see a couple of you are here in the Zoom as well. So be ready to answer any questions and I will play your video. For NF1 and NF2 today is uh, biostatistical analysis of um, identifying the pathway mappings and drugs are complex for NF1. And NF2, repurposing the existing drugs for use in NF1 and NF2 is uh, complex, and RNA sequencing from data sets uh, of uh, NF1 and NF2 cellular models are complex. Well, how you're trying to resolve this is automating the unsupervised grouping and ranking genes, uh, metabolic and signal pathways and drugs with similar biomarkers, and showing interactions, and identify opportunities for repurposing existing drugs for use in NF1 and NF2. Uh, the RNA sequencing data is um, divided into two sets which is bulk and SCRNSEC. Uh, the bulk can be differentially expressed genes and the uh, SCRNSEC can be framing cellular identity. Identify raised cell population and cell population dynamics can be achieved from RNSEC. So framing cellular identity hypothesis can be identified using this uh, disease genes um, and uh, identify disease pathways, repurposed drugs, need to study the drug combination effects and drug binding structure prediction. So the materials and methods we used is uh, we used the data sets from the uh, NF1 um, and uh, the tools we used is Python, R and um, bioinformatic tools such as GCSC and uh, top genes. Uh, this is the overview of the RNSEC pipeline. Uh, the testing strategy what we used for um, enriching analysis by the market genes is uh, molecular profile data, gene set database, where uh, we ran the tools for the enriched data sets. So the results can be used for discovery of target cell types, signaling receptors, and medically relevant genes and drug repurposing solutions. So this is how the, the output for the pathway disease and drug rank terms can be classified. Um, how the uh, product is born is we were Barclays Lacks Accelerator um, uh, cohort member and Techstars finalist. Um, we are targeting healthcare companies and care homes and uh, homeless population. Uh, this is the size of the market, and uh, this is the direct and indirect competitors. Uh, the advantage what we are trying to use is we are using machine learning and AI-based image classification for uh, NF1 um, disease um, um, updates to the doctors. The advantage is API for digital therapeutics. Uh, the subscription model is the business model we are trying to use and um, for RNA sequencing testing. The future roadmap, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do the partnerships and um, uh, incubation for Q4 2022. And by Q2 2023, we'd like to build an API. 
And um, I'm Srinath, co-founder of um, CG Health, and this is my team. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Srinath, and your team, CG Health. Uh, I know you're here if you'd like to say hello. Uh, and any, if any judges have any questions for the team. And then a quick note, uh, ditto for NF is the next presenter. Uh, but yeah, judges, any questions for uh, team CG Health? Yeah, a uh, quick question, uh, good presentation. I think I I may, might have missed it, but I didn't see any imaging data. Um, yes. But there was a mention uh, of it. Uh, how, how is that used? Uh, so we we actually, we tried to develop the machine learning algorithm for the image classification um, for the NF1, NF2, so that, uh, um, you know, the patients can remotely send to the doctors, but uh, along with the RNA site. Um, uh, I could actually send that output uh, image uh, data later. I think we don't have now. And Helen, who is the, uh, the researcher, uh, couldn't join this call today. Okay, so that was actually not part of this. Uh, I'm just trying to understand if you used it in this or not used it. Uh, no, we didn't use that. Uh, the, the ultimate goal okay. is to use the image classification for machine learning, using machine learning uh, on, on the embedded in an app so that uh, you know the patients uh, with the symptoms can actually regularly update the doctors or healthcare workers uh, for the symptoms and get the medication uh, yeah okay so what's the innovation here what's the next step here i'm a bit unclear yes uh, we are actually trying to achieve two goals here one is the current uh, 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 pathways and drug uh, discovery kind of two. and the second one is uh, using machine learning and ai um, to uh, interact doctors from the patients, you know, uh, you know, with, with, with the NF1 and NF2 disease, uh, um, uh, it's it's quite hard to come out of the public and then um, talk about the symptoms. So we are actually trying to build the image classification using machine learning and AI, uh, so that patients can actually take take a photo for the symptoms and then upload that in the uh, doctor's database, so the doctors can actually read the data sets from the uh, Gini. Uh, data set types and also work on the patient symptoms and uh, uh, and and, uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, recommend them any further medication is uh, needed and also the data sets would be useful for the researchers to analyze analyze the drugs and then uh, probably any uh, any any further modifications can be done from the R and S side. So yeah, those are the two parts what we are trying to build. <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks, Rinat. I think yes, I'll, I'll I have let a follow. The... Yeah, go ahead, Deepak. I have a follow-up question uh, re, uh, after Tanu, Tarun. So, I, mean, <laughs> I did not see any analysis in the. Uh, the sorry, have you, have you done any analysis, or are there any preliminary results from this uh, image uh, uh, image processing which you have done? Uh, yes. Uh, um... Uh, so we did we did actually use a small algorithm actually um, uh, to uh, to identify the uh, patient uh, conditions. I mean uh, for NF1 and NF2, and then we did uh, we did actually try to uh, figure out what the symptoms are. Uh, I mean from the earlier um, uh, consultation with the doctors. I think we we are progressing well. I think now, but we need some more. Um, resources now to uh, exactly identify the images because some images are uh, not able to identify from the machine learning algorithm. So we would like to actually um, refocus on the algorithm so that the images can be clear uh, where the patient's symptoms can actually, whenever a patient actually take an image you know, with a phone, uh, that was not clear. So but we are actually trying to add some more you know, algorithms here to exactly identify the image so that doctors can understand the symptoms. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, uh, Srinath and the team CG Health. Uh, up next, we have Ditto for NF. I'll pull up your video now. Is it GT Pesak? Hello, my name is Tarun Mamadi. I'm representing Team Ditto for NF, and we are participating in Challenge 2 for the hackathon. NF1 is a GTPase activating protein and acts as a tumor suppressor by negatively regulating the small GTPase RAS. The article published earlier this year shows in how, how the GRD is activated in the open state 
and binds to RAS for normal function. We're going to give a couple examples on how variants in this region affect the function. In the project overview, we're using open cravat for annotations, variant annotations, and then synthesize impact from deleterious prediction tools like Ditto and protein impact from suffix seq and STM. We're also using functional studies from literature. We plan to use uh, derived patient derived omic data and predict the overall pathogenicity for NF1 variants. We use ClearMark data to train our data model. We're using pathogenic and benign variants for training and, pred and predicting the deleterious scores for NF1 variants from LOVD. Apart from probability scores, we also get explanations on why our model is predicting a variant as deleterious or not. For example, if a variant is in the coding region, it's more likely to predict as deleterious than benign. We also benchmarked our tool and it outperformed almost all other tools in given any type of variant. Here is an example um, of a variant lying close to the GRT region, but it is classified as pathogenic in both ClinVar and LOVD. It was coded as 92% deleterious, and suffix seq said it is, it reduces stability of NF1. We looked at um, SMT scores for both closed and open state, in closed state, it's increasing stability, and in open state, it is predicted to reduce stability, hence confirming the functional report from literature that is severely damaging. Here is another variant which is not reported in Clinoir or LRBD, but is reported as likely benign in functional studies. Ditto predicted it as 83% deleterious, and the protein impact tools um, predicted it as moderately reducing stability. We could, in, we could use more data like the alpha fold protein impact predictions and protein-protein interactions to find how RAS is binding to NF1 and also integrate these scores with specific patient-derived omic data to accurately predict the pathog pathogenicity and functional impact of NF1 variants. In the next six months, we're going to work, in, work on integrating these data sets um, and patient-derived data and um, make it into a workflow so people can use using a single command. We're going to publish our results adapting FAIR guidelines. Thank you for the organizers and the cloud and the cloud-based solution precision medicine platform for that is awesome cool thank you team ditto for nf tarun i know you're here to answer any questions uh and judges do you have any questions for tarun uh i have one question uh so based on your AUC results, uh, AUC numbers, the result look good, but have you also looked at the uh, pre uh, precision and recall curve uh, to see how is your uh, true positive, uh, uh, false positive and false negative rates? Yes, we do have precision, uh, precision recall curve um, plot as well, but in the interest of time, I didn't share it in the presentation. Uh, Okay, that sounds good. So, what uh, besides? So, what are the implica implication of uh, this tool? How are you planning to uh, are planning researchers and practitioners to use this tool? Um, so, we have multiple predictors um, at various levels at the genome for ditto and protein protein interactions like SAFX seq and S STM. Um, for clinicians, um, these are just predictors. And for each patient, we want to use these predictors for giving a score and then looking at specific patient to see if the expression levels are going up and down. Um, so our, in the next six months, we're trying to collect 
some kind of omic data for patients and compare um, the predictors with the actual gene expression to see um, the accurate pathogenicity of variant. Thank you. Awesome. Any other questions uh, for Tarun and the team? There is a question from Ben. Maybe we can take that live. Um, ben is asking, how are you using how are you using Pubdator? So we haven't um, really used Pubdator yet. There are dark boxes on the overall um, pipeline, which we are um, planning to use them in the next six months to integrate a lot more data into our predictors. That's our incubation proposal. Awesome, cool. Thank you, Tarun, to you and your team. And lastly, we just have one presentation left. We have NF1. Cami, let me pull up this one now. Uh, this video is a bit on the longer side, but I'll play about four minutes or so of it, and then the team can answer any questions. Hello, and welcome to our group. We are NF1 Cami. We come from the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. We are comprised of a variety of skill sets. First, our lead engineer, Nathan Dwarshuis is a bioinformatician at the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. He did his PhD at Georgia Tech in biomedical engineering and investigated bioinformatic approaches to CAR T-cell therapy. Brian Mustafa, our assistant engineer, is a data analyst who works in Python, R, and SQL. Finally, Ulysses Santamaria, our product manager, is a clinical researcher at the National Institutes of Health with experience in neurodegenerative disorders and infectious disease. Together, we bring a synthesis of both clinical experience of how the medical field uses data science and informatic approaches, knowledge of current and bleeding edge bioinformatic approaches, and experience in creating a future software program for our endeavors. The issue, given a germline variant data set from neurofibromatosis type one or NF type one, can a strategy be developed to score the pathogenicity of NF1 variants? Due to the rarity of the disease, which occurs at a rate of about one in 2,500 births, there is little known about the correlation between genetic variants and the probability of disease onset. Current research suggests that there may be some correlation between germline mutations and clinical presentation. Despite the limited size and power of studies available for study among this population, new variants in germline mutations are constantly being added to public databases such as LOVD. These established databases currently have a methodology for predicting whether a variant may be pathogenic or not, but is done in retrospect as shown in our figures. What has been unable to be achieved in the literature is a predictive tool for determining the likelihood of a novel variant resulting in pathogenic outcomes and to what phenotype it may manifest for a patient. Our figure is a visual representation of this process. We begin with a point mutation shown with an orange box for our gene, NF1, which turns this gene into a variation of the gene as shown by changing the color from black to orange to show the transformation of the gene into a variant. Next, this variant undergoes pathogenicity analysis as currently being approached by genetic repositories such as LOVD, which has poorly understood correlation to the clinical diagnostic criteria of NF type one. The solution. We constructed a causal inference model to explain how the variables in a given germline data set are related to each other. We then gave additional inputs for individual variables that are specific to the NF1 gene that will supplement and modify existing pathogenicity scoring systems. The reason for such an approach comes down to many variables. Our chief concern in the solution is the ability for physicians and other clinical staff to understand our method and our analysis of the relationship 
from their input to phenotype. In our collective experience in working with physicians, we have come to find clinical staff slow to adopt various machine learning or algorithmic approaches because of the lack of transparency in black box machine learning methods. For me, I have been to dozens of talks at the National Institutes of Health where machine learning or computational scientists present methods that produce good results in their endeavors, be it image processing, clinical diagnosis, or something else. In every one of these talks, there's always a question of, how does this work? That always comes from a clinician. Once the researchers answer that they cannot see under the hood of their method, the clinicians are quick to disregard the method. Therefore, constructing a transparent and viewable model like what we have constructed is the first step to gaining a physician's trust to use any solution created as a byproduct of our method. All right. And for the team, I'm going to cut it a little short. I know that there's a couple more minutes to your presentation uh, and the judges will have access to that. Um, but thank you to Team NF1 Cami. Uh, if you're here, feel free to come off mute and uh, answer any questions from our judges. Thank you, Lucas. I'm Ulysses. I'm here representing this team today. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, Ulysses. Uh, any questions, judges? Anything at all? I guess my question to you, Ulysses, is to um, and use this opportunity to synthesize the output of your project. The main output yeah so, so the from the presentation of course the which was seven minutes long we couldn't play it in respect to the other teams that stayed within four minutes yes so um do, only due to time constraints we couldn't produce any sort of working demo and uh you know what we're really pitching here is a philosophical change in how we approach these things but the end product results would be a um as according to at least for the first iteration according to nathan would be a web form that spits out an answer based on the inputs um, or some sort of web interface or somebody can generate or submit variant information in terms of sequence or name or FASFA, whatever the, uh, the, the input may be. And then you get some sort of modifier back or description, or if it were to be linked with a database like LOBD, uh, you, we would pull up the original pathogenicity score and then give a recommendation um, as to whether its score would be shifted, uh, especially in, especially in cases with variables of unknown significance. So uh, I'm not sure how much that makes sense, but essentially a web interface with input for variants that can connect with other genetic repositories and then give a modifier based on our supplemental input. All right, any last questions for Ulysses and the team? Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you, Ulysses. You are our last team. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen here. Thank um, you. Just one more note from me. Thank you again to all the teams for submitting. Uh, we'll wrap up here in a second. But um, just a reminder, if any other questions come in from the judges, uh, either at the end of this webinar or a little bit after, I'll make sure to uh, forward those to you as soon as I can so that uh, you can answer those as judging goes on. Um, but yeah, thank you again to everyone. And uh, Salvo, back over to you. Yeah, I just want to echo what Lucas said. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, this was the first time that, you know, the judge looked at your project, of course. There may be more questions and I will, you know, um, if you can keep the conversation going on Slack, if there are other uh, que additional questions that will come up, we'll have um, the um, this week basically dedicated to look at your projects, writing some uh, comments, suggestions for the for for your fruition. So really, really, um, you know, looking 
into this. So if you can keep an eye on the Slack channel, we'll reach out with additional question. Uh, what I want to point out here is the Schwannomatosis Open Research Collaborative project that we are working on. And Sasha, who is a judge that is it's on the is on, on the panel, uh, is, is running and is leading. Uh, this is something that you guys may be interested to collaborate. Uh, you can talk to her uh, over Slack or over email, or you can learn more um, at the uh, addresses uh, below. Um, the goal is really to bring together enough domain experts and individual with computational expertise to gain new insights in schwannomatosis using publicly available genomic data. We are planning to have also a satellite meeting for participants here at the CTF conference in uh, um, Scottsdale next year. So if, if you're interested to collaborate and be part of this team, you may also get a ticket to, uh, to the conference. And here is Sasha. I don't know if you want to spend a few words, Sasha, just for this. Just want to give you the opportunity to... Yeah, sure. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Sasha. I'm a postdoc at Sage Bio Networks, um, and I've been largely working on putting this project together. Um, we are focused on schwannomatosis, um, which is one of the rarest versions of neurofibromatosis. And um, there's a really pressing need for computational expertise uh, in NF in general, and, and especially in schwannomatosis. Um, I have a background in genomics. So what I'm trying to do is to put together a community-based research project using publicly available schwannomatosis genomic data um, to bring together people who have expertise in an app with people who have computational expertise. Um, so we have a schwannomatosis data that is publicly available. Um, we have proposed some analyses that we have some people working on. We're also open to um, hearing proposals that anybody else might want to see done with this data. So if you're interested in contributing, if you have schwannomatosis data, you might think would be useful to us. If you have analyses, you might want to see us do on some of this data. Um, if you want to help actually do some of these computational analyses, or if you just want to provide either computational or NF expertise, we welcome all of your contributions. Um, and you can find out more on our Synapse page, which will link to, it links to our Project GitLab page, it links to a sign-up form where you can get, or um, our email address so you can contact us to get more information. We also have a Slack page um, for asynchronous communication, and we are, like Salvo said, hoping to have a satellite meeting, planning to have a satellite meeting for this project to bring together everyone to, who's working, who's made contributions to the project at the next year's CTF conference. So. Great. Thank you, Sasha. So reach out to her if you have any ideas how to contribute. So <clears throat> this is my last slide. So we'll see you on November 16 at 12 p.m. Eastern time for a winner announcement. This is my last slide. So um, I don't know if there is anything else we need to add. I will stop sharing if there is any general question from participants judges anything you guys want to share is the time one last thing for me to salvo just so everyone knows um maybe not today but certainly by tomorrow we'll post the recording of this as well um sure. i'll put it in slack and we'll send you an email as well so if any of your team wasn't able to watch or if you'd like to review everything uh we'll make sure you have the link for that um but yeah that's all from all from my side all right thank you all thank you for thank you everyone oh thank you bye take care thanks guys thank you